evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody doing tonight? Is, is the mic on? I said, how's everybody doing tonight? There we go. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to High Volume Fashion 2011, New York City. We're here in the Big Apple, and we're very pleased that all of you are gracing us with your presence for the first High Volume Fashion event. This is uh, to commemorate or to honor Latin fashion. And speaking of Latin fashion and high volume fashion, I would like to invite the creator of this event, the person responsible for all of this, Miss Christina Madrona. You look beautiful. Miss Christina Madrona, oh gosh, amazing woman. She's She's very capable, very hard worker, and she's full of energy. So she's a wonderful person to be around, and she has a vision, and through her vision and a lot of help, this has come to, uh, to what it is today. So I'd like to have her say a few things about it. Good night to everybody. Good night. Well, well Good night. <laughs> I like to be behind the scene, you know. I hope everybody enjoyed the, the show. And thank you very much for everybody here. We have our first fashion presentation for High Volume Fashion. This is High Volume. It's fashioned by Chris Madrona Collections, Fax, Maria Bonita, Graf Brazil, Canawan from Colombia and Brazil, accessories by Jarvis Pereira from Atlanta, Patricia Maura from Brazil, Hanalo Manuel from Brazil.
have a special guest upon us this evening, and I would like to personally welcome him as well. Dr. 90210, also known as Dr. Robert Ray, has joined us all the way from Beverly Hills, and he is uh, he's quite the strapping young man, and uh, he's going to tell us a young. <laughs> Why don't you come on up, Doc? Look at, look at this dog. We got him for this dog. Strong. I wouldn't want to fight this one. <laughs> and I'm a good fighter. Well, Dr. Ray, uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. I'm so grateful. It's such a great foundation. Such a great cause. Uh, Brazilians are such great designers. You know, they are. They are, actually. They're, uh, they're really just, they lead the way a lot of the times with they're really the whole Latin community. What can you tell us a little bit about what do you do? You, you practice plastic surgery. Is that right? Well, you know, I cut during the week and I cut on the weekends. You know, all Brazilians are, we all fight, right? All Brazilians are great jiu-jitsu fighters. Um, you know what? I, uh, it's really about the journey. And uh, I, you know, I came from a rough Brazilian neighborhood. My mom was a fascinator. My mom was, uh, uh, you know, she cleaned houses. And I was robbing stores two or three times a week. Uh, I'd been to jail twice. And one beautiful day, uh, you know, two gringos knocked on my door. And uh, they brought me to America and raised me. And so because I had been uh, in this impoverished side of Brazil, I knew the rough side of life. Uh, I very rapidly tried to accumulate material goods as fast as possible. But at mid-career, I've been a surgeon 20 years. At mid-career, I had an epiphany, as many of us do mid-career. And I realized that um, I wasn't happy, you know, with the Italian cars and the multi-million dollar houses. Who saw the episode of the million dollar kitchen? I learned the key to marriage. I learned the key to marriage. Yes, sweetie, no, sweetie, I'll do better next time, right? That's the, that's the key to being married 11 years. But um, I realized that material things were not making me happy. So when I was poor, looking on the other side of the track, seeing, well, those rich people, they must be happy. Once I got there, I wasn't happy. I had a big void in my heart. And so what I started to do is I start initially small trips, then big, big trips. And today, I don't take any money for my practice at all. I dedicate everything I make in my practice. Uh, see, now I look in this direction, I lose my train of thought. Uh, let me go like this. I, uh, today, everything I earn, I put on humanitarian missions. I, I, that's, that's we'll Africa, we'll be operating in Africa in July, in São Paulo, uh, Ilha Bela, muitas, muitas vezes. So, uh, but still, I'm constantly looking for ways uh, to help our neighbor. And I tell you, people are taking out well butrin, all kinds of antidepressants. Uh, unless, you know, it's clinical, if it's clinical, it's different. But if you're a little, if you're a little blue, the key is not some drug that's going to give you Parkinson's disease. Uh, the, the, the key is, help your fellow man. Help your fellow man. Be happy. Choose to be happy. When you want to throw daggers at people, smile instead and love them. You know what I'm saying? Can you tell us a little bit about the foundation? Uh, how long has it been around for? That sort of thing. Sure. The foundation started in 1992. Uh, after my family left Brazil, Maceió, in the northeast of Brazil, because my sister was diagnosed with leukemia. She was 11 years old. The doctor gave her three months to leave. My parents did not accept that and they decided to travel throughout Brazil and find the best place to find her the best treatment possible. And they, they, find out, they found out that only a bone marrow transplant could save her life and her best chance would be me or my brother. Unfortunately, my brother and I was not a match. There was a 25% chance. So my family decided to sell everything we had in Brazil and find the best hospital they could find in the world and the best doctor to say, try to save her life. Um, and when they find out, they found out that Memorial Sloan Catherine Cancer Center here in New York was the best hospital in 1989 and had one of the best doctors starting to do bone marrow transplant. And we sold everything that we came and we came to New York. Unfortunately, when she arrived here, they also told us that she had leukemia only a bone marrow transplant could save her life, and my brother and I was not a match. And they searched the National Marrow Donor Program, the bone marrow registry here in the United States, where there were about 89,000 donors. But unfortunately, all those 89,000 donors were mostly Caucasians, and they, she could not find a match. So they told us that her best match would be Latinos, Brazilians, because of ethnic and no genetic background. And my family started to do bone marrow drives throughout the United States, and registering thousands of people willing to donate bone marrow. Unfortunately, after two years of recruiting thousands of donors, she did not find a match and she passed away. However, when she was being treated, 
even though she was only 11, 12 years old, she said when she was cured, she wants to start a foundation to help all those kids she was looking around in the hospital suffering with needles and, and medications and chemo and losing their hairs. And she wants to start a foundation to, to save their lives. So after she passed away, my family decided to, you know, following her wishes, to start a foundation. Because also many of the donors we recruited to see if it was a match to her ended up being a match to other patients. So the foundation started in 1992. And today we are the largest recruitment center for the Be The Match Registry, the National Marathon Fund. Wow.